Now let's go on to verse 9. We're almost ready to climb the mountain. You want to see the greatness of God? Get yourself up on a high mountain. Now I don't even like climbing and I don't even own a mountain bike. And this has got nothing to do with mountains. It's got to do with a place of perspective. It's got to do with stepping back from the trials and the circumstances of your life and saying this morning, you know what? I'm going to lay that burden down today. I'm going to set that thing off to the side. And I'm not going to let it crowd out these thoughts about the greatness of God. I'm going to lay my hurt down this morning. I'm going to lay my burden down this morning. I'm going to lay my anxiety about the future off to the side. And I'm going to give my full attention to the word of God this morning. I'm getting up on a mountain. O oh, Zion, bearer of good news, lift up your voice mightily. God, help me to do that this morning. O oh, Jerusalem, bearer of good news, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Isn't that a great thing? The cities of Judah, these are all just terms for God's people. They're references to the lineage of the nation of Israel. Say to the cities of Judah, that's you guys. Say to the followers of Christ, the children of God, here is your God. Now we're ready to climb. Look at verse 10. Before we go up, we're going to learn a little bit about the heart of the person at the top, our great God. And verse 10 and 11 are two sides of the coin, two sides of the nature of God. Verse 10, verse 11. Which one are you most familiar with? Most people know either the God of verse 10 or the God of verse 11. And we need to know both. Verse 10. Behold, the Lord will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense, that's a picture of justice, is before him. Verse 10 is the holiness of God, and the justice of God, and the righteousness of God, and his strong arm. And the idea is, is that God bears his holy arm, and comes to his people, and looks at our lives, and says, get it together. You know about that God? Same God, verse 11. Here's his heart. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, notice his arm, his arm of justice, it's just circle, arm, arm, same God. In his arm he will gather the lambs. What a great picture. That's us. In his arm he'll gather the lambs. Notice the tenderness of that. And carry them in his bosom. He'll gently lead the nursing ewes. In other words, there's special treatment for special needs. And some of you are here this morning, and just like a shepherd would say, now this one's just had a baby, and it's still nursing, so let's give special care. Keep that one really close to the shepherd. And sometimes we have special needs in our lives, and deeper waters we're going through, and greater heartaches and concerns. And it's at those times when we get along with God, and God sees that situation, and he knows it, and he cares for us in an even more particular and personal, individualistic way. Now, if you understand God's heart, we're not going to come back to that again for a lot of verses. We're ready to climb now the mountain of the awesomeness of God. Look at verse 12. And as we would begin this climb, let me just share this first of all. Notice the awesomeness of God in creation. Verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by a span. Well, let's just take those a phrase at a time. Measured the waters... I love the agency of God in creation here. Notice that God has measured the waters in the, get the hollow of your hand ready. Okay, this is, look at that little place down in there in the middle. He's trying to show us how great and how awesome God is. He says, well, you know, just think about all the water in all the world. We did a little research. 912,500 cubic miles of water in the world. That's a mile by a mile by a mile, 912,500 times. God's like, got it, got it right here, got it. And just makes the whole world and all of the water in the hollow of his hand. Look at the greatness of God. He's measured the heaven with a span. Now the span is the distance from the tip of your thumb to the tip of your baby finger. And we can measure different things in our span. I can almost get my span around this orange, if you want to think about size. Now, the picture here is this. The picture, think about it. The picture is, is that God himself, his span, God can palm the world. Okay? God's got it right there. The whole thing, some 25,326 miles all the way around. God's like, got it. Isaiah is trying to describe to us the awesomeness of God. He's calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Think of all the dirt in your backyard if you've ever tried to move a yard of it. 
The Bible says that God takes all of the soil, all of the earth, all of the dirt, and it's like one cup, thanks, make it, and it's done. And again, we see the massiveness of God in creation. And notice also the agency of God in creation, calculating, measuring, spanning. And those who would say that somehow God started some evolutionary process in place and then God withdrew, you couldn't be further from the truth. God spoke the world into existence and he was personally the agency and the instrumentality of its creation. And I believe with all of my heart that God did that in six literal 24-hour days. I'm not troubled or put off in any way by the fact that science thinks they know more than what God's word says. You'll see in just a moment how often the word of God ultimately ends up contradicting what we believe to be true. Notice this next phrase. It says, he weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales. God's like, okay, put the Rockies on this side of the scale. Now just, okay, that's about what we need over there in the States and then in, and now in Canada. Now let's make the Alps, okay. How big do we want those? And he's just like on a scale, like you would weigh up some vegetables or something like that. You know, so often we talk about the imminence of God and how close he is. And we prefer that truth greatly to the one we're talking about this morning, which is the transcendence or the awesomeness of God. Both are important. But we focus so much on the imminence of God, we're like, well, I asked Jesus into my heart. By the way, a phrase that's not found anywhere in scripture, and I understand why people say that. But I think we focus so much, well, God was with me today when I was in my car. Or last night I woke up in the middle of the night and God was with me in my bedroom. And we talk so much about the spatiality of God and the specific location of God that I think we've really skewed the perspective of the imminence and the transcendence of God. God is not really technically in our presence. We are in God's presence. Okay, we, Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. And somehow we've got to get away from this, of course God is everywhere. But if by that you understand him to be this little person who's following you around, then really what you're doing is you're reducing the awesomeness and the greatness of God. We are ever and always in his presence. The idea that a God who can span the earth, that you would move somewhere, and somehow you're closer or farther from him, is ridiculous. We are always and ever in the very center of the presence of our awesome God. And that's what I understand even here as I would continue to share with you. Notice the awesome size of God with respect uh, to us, not just us, but to his unspeakable wisdom. Look at verse 13. He says, who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Now these are rhetorical questions. The answer is very obvious. God is free from influence. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? The point is, is that God has never been informed about anything. God has never been taught. God was like, you're kidding me. Never. God was like, really? I'm going to have to think that through. Never. No one ever said anything to God. He's like, now now there's a perspective. Notice verse 14. With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? All right, we'll just play a little game here. I'll ask the rhetorical question and you give the answer. Ready? With whom did he consult? And who gave him understanding? Who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge? And who informed him of the way of understanding? No one. No one influences God. No one impacts God. No one changes God's mind about anything. Gripped by the awesomeness of God. James, we'll continue this together next time. 